So today's readings from Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. <clears throat> Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is God's word. You may be seated. Okay. Well, good morning, church. You're getting a little, little. Good morning, church. <laughs> I'm going to just use the handheld. How about that? <laughs> I'm going to shut this thing off this morning. Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? There we go. All right. Hey, take your Bibles out and open them up with me, if you would please, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're actually... We're ending the chapter of 1 Corinthians 12 today, going on into next week, the love chapter, one of my favorite chapters uh, of the Bible, of, of the New Testament, where we learn about love and God's design for it and, and what it's all about. But um, today in the message, we're going to be talking, we're going to be finishing out this chapter 12 and really asking the question, what it means to be a great church, what it means to look like to be a great church in light of everything that we talked about so far in chapter 12. And I just got to say, you all are a sight for sore eyes. Can I say that? Um, last week, after Holy Week, I took off for a week for a little bit of a, not a whole week, but I had to come back for uh, some meetings. But I went down south to the great state of Kentucky to do some backpacking. Anybody in here like, like camping? We got some campers. Oh, good. A lot more of you in this service than last service. Yeah. Um, you know, the, nature is just something that energizes me. I mean, like, I, wintertime, I get kind of, like, really draggy. But once I can get out on a trail, yeah. So um, I had to get my batteries recharged. I didn't have a... And so I went down to Kentucky to do some backpacking in this place called Red River Gorge. Anybody ever been there before? Absolutely beautiful, beautiful place. Well, you know, it was a great, it was a great, great trip. And uh, I just want to share just a couple things from it. It's going to kind of bring us into what we're talking about here today. I remember when I, when I left for the trip, uh, Monday morning, I think it was, I got a text message from my buddy Mike. He asked us, you know, we were in the Smokies. Where are you going? I said, well, I'm supposed to be in Red River Gorge. Well, then I get on the trail and then I get this text message. The next slide, next slide, please. This is Mikey. Pretty much all that region is under the gun for powerful storms Tuesday. <laughs> Chance of tornadoes in every quadrant. That's the text message everybody wants to hear, right? <laughs> Right after they're on the trail. Thanks, Mikey. Could you have not texted me that like an hour or two before I... I'm just kidding. Oh, so I ended up going down. Um, I went to this place. Where My plan was, all right, I'm prepared for rain, prepared for weather. Um, what I'll just do is I'll stay off the ridges because, you know, ridges are windier and you're more exposed. And I'll stay in the valleys, but not low enough that I could get washed out with a flash flood. And that was my plan. I think I got the next, next, the next slide there. Yeah, I found this really cool little spot. In between these ridges, camp next to the stream. It was absolutely beautiful. As you can see on the next slide, I set up my camp. There's my tarp and my hammock. I, uh, you can't see the stream there on the left, but I had the place to myself. It's like someone must have got a hold of the weather and said, I ain't going there. Only crazy people do that. <laughs> yeah. um, but I had a great, great couple days, nights in there. That next morning, though, I, I woke up. I knew... For my friend Mikey over here, that was going to be a dicey day. So I threw my rain gear on, started to hike out, and as I'm almost to the ridge of this valley, um, it just starts raining. You know, again, I'm prepared for that, but then it goes, Wah! all this rain comes on me, and I, some of you saw a reel I posted on Facebook where I just like, I found this like outcropping cave thing that I crawled in just to kind of like get out of the rings. It was really bad. 
Well, then I finish that loop. I get up on the ridge, um, and I'm about to do this next loop. This, this is going somewhere, folks. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, I start to do that. I'm, I'm preparing to do my next loop. My next loop was going to be another couple of days. I was going to, again, because of the weather, I'm going to hike in the valley, stay in the valley, because you get out of the wind, you get out of the elements a little bit more. Well, I hike about a half mile on this ridge, okay, on Tuesday, when all of these storms are starting to come. And all of a sudden, this family with this young kid, probably about, I don't know, eight years old, he's like walking my direction, mom and dad and brother and sister behind. He's walking my direction. He sees me, looks up, and he goes, you should turn back now. <laughs> now, I'm, I don't watch a lot of horror movies, but like, I envision this is the sound of the voice. You know, you turn around and on his face goes, ah, 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 you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no joke, I walk probably another quarter mile and the heavens open up. I start getting pelted with marbles. And then, you know that whole, like, uh, you know how you count the lightning and you go on 1,002 from the lightning? No, man. Boom, boom, boom. And I said, nope, that's it. I'm out. Boop. And I got a hotel. <laughs> I bailed. Well, then I go and look at the weather on the, on the way back. And I, this is what was on top of me, this, like, purple thing right on top of where I was at. I was like, yeah, that was probably a good choice. But I get to the hotel. And, you know, when you go backpacking, there's not showers out in the thing, so out in the sticks. So you kind of, like... Whoever you encounter, you're like really weary, leery of. Well, thankfully, the hotel I go to had all like COVID stuff still up. So I'm like, you're, I'm, I'm telling the lady, I'm checking in, I'm like, you are, be thankful you're behind that glass. I just got to say this right now. <laughs> all right, I check in, I got out safely. But, you know, we were in this study of 1 Corinthians 12, and I was thinking about this all along my trip, you know. Um, it kind of kept coming up in my brain. And especially this week as I was preparing for this message, as we're finishing out this chapter, in that like, you know, like this, every part, of, this is my, kit, my pack, you know, everything that I pack for a trip like this does something unique, does something well, and does at most three things. Now, the Something can be multifunctional. We were always taught, like when I went to survival school, if something can be multifunctional, make it. It's like my cup here, you know, doubles as a bear bell, right? So I don't have to pack a bear bell, essentially, because I was in bear, yeah. But I would look really dumb if when the heavens opened up on me, I took this and went like this to try to protect me from the rain. Doesn't that look dumb? I got something else that does that. Everything in this kit represents something that's vitally important for me to come home safe and alive. Water bottle. By the way, that was my cook pot. That was also my wash pot. That's also a lot of things. You know, everything in here is super vital for me to have a great trip and come back in one piece. Water filter. Really important in the backcountry. You can't just drink the water. You got to filter it. Knife. Really important if you want to have a campfire or if you want to fend off the bears or the weirdos. Just kidding. There weren't any weirdos there. Just one. <laughs> tent stakes. These are, these are amazing tent stakes. They are horrible spoons. <laughs> you don't want to... Like, it's like in everything in this kit is designed to do something else. At my age... I'll tell you something I get really appreciative of on these trips nowadays are a good set of hiking poles. You carry a big pack around and you got like two pounds a day worth of food, so I've got about eight pounds of food on my back. Like hiking poles are great. They, they help my knees. They help hold my uh, tarp up, as you saw in the picture. Like that's part of the, their function, what they do. Each and every piece of this kit is designed to do something different and designed to do it well. This trip, I was especially thankful for this piece of kit. This is... Marie Poncho. Covers my pack. I'm not going to put it on because I can't even put it on anybody. I've got this microphone in my hand. Everything in here does something different. It's something that's vitally important for my enjoyment of the trip, but also my ability. Chair, I won't get that out yet. Hammock, I'm not sleeping in the dirt. That's for sure. I don't know what that is, but I'm sure it's important. Oh, yeah, sleeping bag. 
Well, what happened if you're in a negative degree? I mean, like, you got to have stuff like this in order to stay alive, folks, because you get dehydrated or you get, not dehydrated, what do you call it, hypothermia. My tarp, my, it's my tarp, my tent. I got to have all of this stuff. Like, if I didn't have this, I'd be exposed to the rain, the elements at nighttime. Bug net, oh my word. Can I get an amen for bug nets? I don't like mosquitoes eating me alive while I'm hanging in a hammock, basically as a burrito there. Like, oh, and I can't forget all this other stuff. Lighter, that's really important to have. It's really important to have, especially if you want to eat, which means it's also important that you have a stove to cook your food on and fuel to go with it. A headlamp, in case the bears attack you at night, you can run away, or try at least. All this. You ready? Toilet paper? Amen? All right, can I get an amen? <laughs> this is great toilet paper. It's also decent kindling. It's not good rain material. <laughs> I was thinking about this all week. Like, each one of these pieces, they're designed to do something different. And each of them, like, I, if I didn't have any one of these things, it would make for my trip to be a not-so-great trip. Because either I'm not eating, or I'm not sleeping, or I'm dehydrated. And it got me thinking about what we've been talking about, what we saw in Ephesians 4 today, how Christ himself designed the church to be different things, the people in it, giving them different gifts. In Ephesians 4, it uses it very direct. It says that Christ himself gave the church apostles, prophets. Did you see that? Gave himself. Christ himself gave. It is he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Like, not everything is the same, and that's on purpose. Well, when we come to 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to back a little bit. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12. We're finishing out this chapter considering what Paul has to say about this idea that there are different gifts that make up the body of Christ. There are different components. I'm using this backpacking analogy a lot this week because I was thinking about this all on my trip. Like, there are different component parts to what it means to be church. All of them are important. All of them have various functions. If you want to have a good experience, they all need to be working together. And so at this time, would you stand for the reading of God's Word as I read 1 Corinthians 12, verses 27 through 31. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And I would encourage you as you're having a seat to pull out those notes that you received when you came in. Hopefully you got those when you came in because I think there's some things as we sort of round out this chapter. Now some of the stuff I want to share today is going to kind of depend on a little bit of your understanding or at least having read the first 26 verses of 1 Corinthians 12. But I think there are some things in this chapter, if you were to drill down as we round out this chapter, that Paul would say is key for a church to experience health and success. There's several things in this chapter. I'm going to highlight a few of them and hopefully help us see and realize that every part of the church is important. And every part of the church needs to do what it was designed to do in order to be the church God designed for it to be. And so again, what would Paul say is key for a church to experience success and health in light of this chapter? The first thing, for its people to discover and deploy the gifts they've been given. For the people, for the people in the church to discover and deploy the gifts 
they've been given. If you are sitting in this room this morning and you are in Christ Jesus, your faith is in Christ Jesus, He has given you a gift that He wants you to use in conjunction with other people and other gifts in the church for the building of His kingdom, for the health of His church, for the life of His family. And it's incumbent upon us to discover those gifts and to deploy those gifts. There are all kinds of them. Paul lists some of them here. We heard some of them in Ephesians 4. Paul talks about some in Romans. But it's important that the people of the church discover and deploy the gifts they've been given. In the first Corinthian church, this was kind of a problem. This posed to be a challenge because there were some people in the church that were like, oh, I'm a tent peg. Woo-hoo. And some of the other ones like, oh, I'm a fire. I'm better than you. And Paul's like, baloney. Are all of you tent pegs? Are all of you lighters? Are all of you fuel canisters? <laughs> no. Did you hear that in the text? That was a rhetorical question. He's saying, no, you all aren't alike. Each of you is different. You need to discover and deploy what those gifts are. Just, you know if you've had a successful backpacking trip, if you came home safely. <laughs> and in order to make it out alive, you've got to use the stuff you pack. It'd be ludicrous for, us to go, for someone to go camping and leave their pack full. People need to take out what they've got and use it for the building of God's kingdom. Discover and deploy the gifts they have. Physical health takes work. Right? Just as physical health takes work, spiritual health takes work, and corporate spiritual health takes work. By corporate, I don't mean corporation. I mean corporate as in the body of Christ, the gathered people of God. It takes work. It takes development and deployment of our gifts to be healthy, to pursue health as a church. And Paul's reminding these people in this church that even though they're each different, they're different by design. God gave some. Did you see that in the text? God gave some. God did this. In 1 Peter 4, I love how it reads this. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. The deployment principle. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You know what a steward is? A steward is, not a stewardess. A steward is someone who takes good care of something they've been given, uses it. While you are, I believe, in my humble opinion, you're sitting in a great church, not because of me, not because of any one person, but because of so, so many people who see the mission of Jesus and take it up Again, while I believe you're sitting in a great church, can you imagine the kind of church, the kind of impact this church would have if we all jumped on board with that idea? Discovering and deploying our gifts for the kingdom and glory of God. That's the first thing. I think Paul is like, for a healthy church, you've got to discover and deploy these gifts. Secondly, for its people to encourage, honor, and uplift those with gifts they have not been given. Now, I say they, I, I think I need to clarify the they in this sentence. Like, um, and I, I use this in the first service. I am a pretty good, um, I don't know, I, I do certain things good, my wife does certain things better. I'm not a good cook. If you come to a potluck and I bring something in and you like it, I didn't make it. I guarantee it. <laughs> my wife did because she's a good cook. That's what I mean when I talk about the they in this sentence. I've not been given it, but what I want to do is encourage people who don't have the gifts that I have. You want to experience health as a church? What we need to be about in this church, in any church, is encouraging, honoring, and uplifting people whose gifts are different than ours. Because, I like how Blomberg wrote this, and this is a quote in your in your outline, he says, Christianity, Christianity is not merely a personal religion, but fundamentally corporate. Hear that again. Christianity is not a merely personal religion, but fundamentally corporate. Did Jesus come to save you? Yes. But he came to save you into something, his body, which is made up of many parts. As we've been reading about throughout this chapter, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 4, there are all these different parts of the church that are vitally important for the church to not only survive, but thrive. And it's important for the church, for the people in the church to encourage, honor, and uplift those whose gifts they have not been given. 
If you've been one of, with us any, any length of time, you know the Corinthians were struggling at this. There's some indication that some people in the church again were like, oh, I've got this gift. This is making me super spiritual. And Paul's like, wait, 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 wait a second. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. You need all the gifts working together. Or to lean in the backpacking, you know, illustration again. Some people were, uh, some people in the Corinth were thinking they were lighters. <laughs> and that that was the most important thing. And then setting everything else on fire in the process. You ever meet someone like that? Whew. Someone who never has anything kind to say about someone else. That's depressing. I feel sorry for those kinds of people. What kind of life is that? Well, Paul wants his church to realize, he wants this church to realize, and they, they desperately need to realize, is that if, if they were going to thrive in the mission of Jesus, one of the things they needed to be doing was cultivating, encouraging those with gifts they didn't have, and working with those, uplifting one another up. Encouragement is one of the strongest motivations. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, like you had a really bad day, and then someone gives you a word of encouragement. Huge. Huge. Word of encouragement at the right moment will give any can of Red Bull a run for its money. <laughs> I've experienced that. And so it's important that the church, that its people, encourage, honor, uplift those with gifts they've not been given. And I love how it says in Romans 12.10, I like how the English Standard Version renders this. It says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Like, can you imagine that if in a church, the only competition that existed was outdoing someone else and showing people honor? People would be beating down the doors to get into a church like that. Imagine the kind of impact you'd have on a community if a church was known for that. Outdoing honor? Love that. Do you want to be a part of a great church? Like, take that step. Take up the mantle of encouraging someone, outdoing honor, and finding someone who's, who has a gift and encouraging that in that gift. I mean, look at it. Look at some of these. It talks about some of these. In the, if someone's a good teacher, encourage them. If they're a good administrator, encourage that person. Uplift that person. If someone works miracles, I'll tell you what I discovered this week. I am convinced my chiropractor has the gift of healing. <laughs> Coming back from a trip like that, I'm like, oh, I'll go see my, my chiropractor. I'm like, woo, afterwards, it felt so amazing. Like, encourage, and I tell him that, man, you are the best. I love you. <laughs> it's kind of awkward. He kind of, we grew up together, so it's, it's, he's, he's cool with that. I mean, I, when I talked about that. And I think healthy churches are made up of ones whose people make a regular habit of encouraging people in their gifts, as they use their gifts, as they deploy their gifts, as they're developing their gifts. But also, don't encourage someone who doesn't have a certain gift. This is something the church has been really bad at too. We'll put people up on, I'm not saying anything about anybody here, just to make sure that this is the... But you'll put somebody up on stage and give them a microphone and tell them to sing a song and they just, that's not their gift. That's something we've got to be careful of too. Encourage people in the gifts they have. Uplift those in the gifts they have. And be okay when somebody doesn't have the gift that you have. Some gifts are upfront gifts. Some gifts are behind the scenes gifts. I watched the sermon last week and I love how Pastor Key talked about this. Like, you know what? The sound guy, the media people, like their best job is when you don't notice. Praise God for that. That helps us to worship without barriers, without distraction. Those gifts are vitally important. And it's kind of like we have different gifts, but they're all important. If any one of these things was out of, I select my kit very carefully, by the way. There's a phrase, there's a saying in backpacking world, it's every ounce counts. <laughs> so I take, I, I scrupulously go through my kit each and every time to say, all right, do I really need this? Do I really need this? Do I really need this? And what I've come and I've whittled it down after 15 years of doing it. Like pretty much everything in here, I'm like, this is it. This is it. I need it. And if any one of these things was missing, it'd be a bad experience. Because <laughs> I'm either not going to sleep, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to drink, I'm going to be cold the whole time, or wet, or not know how to get where I'm going. 
or have to use leaves. Sorry. Thirdly, what would Paul say is key to a church to experience health and success in light of this chapter? Third thing, last thing here, for its people to devote themselves to the relentless pursuit of unity despite their diversity. Now, this is where I think the chapter really um, hits home. Okay, because if you've been paying attention to this church, they were having a struggle. They were on the struggle bus <laughs> when it comes to being united. There was infighting. There was class separation. Some wealthy, wealthy people in the church kind of um, were having like their own thing going while poor people were kind of left out somewhere else. Some people were getting drunk at communion. I mean, there was all this like division and, just, and stuff in the church and I think one of the things this chapter should point us to as we round it out is this idea that, you know what, if you want to be a great church, you've got to be unity. You've got to be united despite your diversity. There's nothing wrong with being different. In fact, every single one of us is different. That's a good thing. That's a God thing. God designed each thing to be different, but He designed them all to work together. And togetherness means unity, not uniformity. We should not all be alike. If we are all alike... That's a problem. God desires unity, not uniformity. Remember, Paul wrote this chapter, he wrote this book, in fact, to kind of help this church. They were divided over the, these chapters, especially 12, 13, 14, divided over all these gifts. Paul's plea to the Corinthians is, get with it. Y'all are different. That's a good thing. Now work together despite your differences, despite your distinctions, and the reason why I think this is one of the clinchers in this chapter, in this whole book, in fact, is, is because of the fact that we live, eat, breathe, and drink rugged individualism in our culture. We live in a society that says you can have it your way, when you want it, how you want it, and your way is the most important way there is. And this rears its ugly head in the church when, when we have something we want to see done, we want to have done, and we do things our way, or we have an idea of something, the way we should be thinking about this one thing. We put these blinders up. We fail to see everything else in our periphery that plays into this thing. Again, it's our rugged individualism. And I think if you want to see a healthy church, a healthy body of Christ, we have to devote ourselves to the pursuit, relentless pursuit of unity despite our diversity. Diversity is good. Division, quite honestly, is evil when it's in the church. I think one of the things that should trump our frustration is our commitment to Christ and our common commitment to one another in the church. I think Paul's trying to get the church to wake up and realize, hey guys, you're all different, and that's a good thing. Celebrate that, work, but you got to work together, right? Prophets, in my experience, prophets make horrible administrators. <laughs> but in order for a church to work healthfully, those two need to get together and work together for the common mission they've been given in Christ Jesus. I don't know if you thought about this at all. I think about this a lot. Whenever I read Matthew 28, it's this idea that, you know what, we have a mission statement, but we don't get to choose the mission of the church. Christ gave us that mission. He said what? Go make disciples. That's the mission. That's what Jesus said. This is what the church is to do. This is what, if you're my follower, this is what I want you to do. Make disciples. But oftentimes, we, in the church, when that gets fleshed out, it's like or when we get these different ideas of like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is exactly what I think it, this is going to be. And I don't care what everybody else thinks. I'm going to do it my way. And it causes division. I think part of that plays into what we've been reading. So in conclusion, how can we become a counter-cultural church in light of these things? There's really two things I want to challenge us to think about in light of this chapter, really. And the first one is this, as we each discover develop and deploy our gifts. This is important because God has gifted you according to His sovereignty, His sovereign plan, what He wants you to become, what He wants you to, how He wants you to use your gifts, how He wants you to serve the purpose of His kingdom. Not necessarily inside the walls of a church. Inside, sure, absolutely, in the church, proper building-wise, but as the body of Christ... 
which means that there are probably believers that you are related to by faith that you need to be serving in some way, shape, or form as well outside of these walls because we need each other. We need to be united to one another. and We each need to discover and deploy the gifts God has given us, not shirk the fact or shun the fact that God has made us different. No, being like, no, God has made me a certain way. God has given me a certain gift because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to make that gift available for a spirit to use for, the, for Christ's kingdom. It's vital to be a place, for a church to be a place where people can discover and use the gifts God has given them. The second thing is this, B, as we strive to think and look beyond ourselves. Again, this is, a lot of this is in light of the whole chapter. But what's happening in 1 Corinthians is that people are like, they're fighting over their gifts, thinking one is more important than the other, and that, you know, I really don't need these. Paul talked about that, right? Can the, can the foot really say to the, I, I don't need you? Like, no, no, I can't do that. That'd be ridiculous. And in order to work together, in order to be the kind of body Christ wants us to be, in order to be the body Christ has in fact designed us to be, it's going to take us looking beyond ourselves sometimes. Taking the blinders off and being diligent in discovering how it is we fit into the picture of the church. How are you gifted? How is Christ gifted? If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been gifted. How is that? Okay, ask yourself that. And then after, after you've asked yourself that, ask yourself a follow-up question. What am I doing about it? Am I sitting on it? Is the stuff staying in the pack? Or is it actually getting out and getting used? Some of you here have gifts of evangelism. How do I know? Because I hear you talk about how you share the good news of Jesus with people. You need to keep doing that. You need to develop that gift and keep doing it. Some of you have the gift of hospitality. I know, how do I know that? I come over to your house and the weight of the world comes off my shoulders. You need to live into that gift. You need to think about how that gift plays into the big picture of the church. And strive to think and look beyond yourselves and make yourself available for Christ to use in the building of His kingdom. Again, this is a big struggle for us in our day. I get it because we live in America. <laughs> we see things, rugged individuals see things our way. I don't, you know. But Christ calls us to live above and beyond that. To actually think, to outdo one another in honoring others, in encouraging one another, in letting no unwholesome talk come out of our mouths except for what is profitable for others. My gospel connection is this. In Christ, you play a vital, vital plan, vital part in His plan to save as you use the gifts He's given you to be a gift to others. Now, some guys probably hopefully not any in this room, think they are God's gift to women. I'm not one of those guys. But the fact of the matter is this, that if you're in Christ, you've been given a gift to be a gift to others with, to work alongside of others and their gifts in order to complete and flesh out, to fill out this picture of what Christ calls His church, His body on earth. Think about that. Let's pray. Father, Father, forgive us because we so often, we leave blinders up and we forget that there is a much bigger picture. There's a much a, a bigger thing that's being orchestrated by your sovereign hand. And we fail to, to see that sometimes when we are, we, we bury our heads in the sand of our own giftings, our own ideas. Lord, especially in light of this chapter, though, I pray that you'd help us as a church, help us to be a place where people can discover and deploy their gifts. Father, and I pray that you'd challenge us all to realize that you have sovereignly gifted us in such a way so as to complete a bigger picture of what your church is to become. And God, help us to unite and use our gifts together in such a way so as to impact your kingdom forever as we share the good news, as we live the good news, as we reflect the good news of Jesus to those around us. We pray in His name. Amen.